Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, namaskar and good afternoon to all of you. Respected Professor Babakumar Sharma sir, respected Dean of School of Basic Sciences, Professor Jayanta Kumar Sharma sir, respected Dr. Gautam Kalita sir, my dear uh, Manjil Sekia, dear faculty colleagues, and my dear participants. On behalf of the Assam Kadiranga University, I, Dr. Dimpalpati Mohanta, head of the Department of Mathematics, Kadiranga University, and coordinator of this webinar, welcome you all to the three days international webinar on fundamental mathematics. Before starting this program, I would like to apologize for yesterday's technical fall and thank you, the Assam Kadiranga University and Gonitra, for giving us this opportunity again to conduct this international event. Because of you, we all are going to swim in this uh, beautiful ocean of mathematics for the next three days. And obviously, with the guidance of our three uh, beautiful minds, we all will enjoy this journey in an another level. Uh, as you all know, we have rescheduled our entire session. Uh, yesterday, we have we are trying to communicate with all the participants. Now, instead of uh, 12 to 14, our new schedule is uh, 13, 14, and 17. Uh, we have uh, we have given a break uh, due to the Independence Day and the Sunday we have. So the program will end at 17. Uh, now, I would like to request the Dean School of Basic Sciences. Professor Joyanta Kumar Sharma, sir, to kindly welcome all the participants to this three days international webinar on fundamental mathematics. Please, sir. Sir, you are not audible. I believe I am audible now. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dimpal. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone present here today. Uh, respected uh, Professor Bhabha Kumar Sharma from uh, IIT Guwahati, Dr. Gautam Kalita from Triple IIT Guwahati, Dr. Manjil Saikia, Postdoctoral Research Associate in the Cardiff University, UK, respected faculty colleagues who are present here today, and uh, dear students from India and abroad. First of all, on behalf of the organizing committee, I offer you heartiest welcome to this online international webinar on fundamental mathematics. This is indeed uh, not to mention, it's needless to mention that the recent uh, global pandemic due to COVID-19 has taught us many things. COVID-19 has uh, created a truly unprecedented situation which affects us all, including exchange of knowledge. None of us could ever expect such fast changes to occur in education system. In order to keep continuity with the exchange of academic and scientific uh, knowledge during COVID-19 pandemic, the online platform is indeed the best friend to a large extent, I believe. From a mere option, online education has become a mass mode of delivering education. And as I said, uh, it has become a mass mode of delivering online education. Uh, the Department of Mathematics in the School of Basic Science, Kaziranga University, in association with Ganitsura. So I am specially mentioning Ganitsura and thank them for being with us, for conducting this uh, three days webinar in our journey of, uh, you know, keep continuing with the teaching and learning process and to exchange knowledge among everyone. So with this few note, I believe this uh, three days webinar will be enriching to all of you and you will uh, you know, have good experience and you'll, you all will understand the importance of fundamental mathematics in our life. With these words, uh, once again, I welcome all of you uh, to this webinar uh, starting from today. And uh, I hope that you all will be engaged and the uh, you know, experienced faculty colleagues will be able to hold you uh, during these uh, days in the webinar. Thank you. Dimpal, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, sir, uh, for your beautiful words. Now we have Professor Bhavakumar Sharma, sir. Uh, professor Bhavakumar is a professor of IIT Guwahati. From the last 30 years, sir is actively working to make science and mathematics more popular in various parts of India as well as in abroad. Sir is also an active member of various organizations like MTTS, Assam Academy of Mathematics, Mathematics Education Trust, Mathematics Research Association, AICT, UGC, etc. We are so glad to have you, sir, among us. I also thankful to sir because of uh, giving uh, time uh, today also uh, for this inaugural session. Now I invite 
Professor Bhavakumar sir to deliver his honorable speech. Please sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dimple, for your kind words. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. So, Professor Jayanta Kumar Soma, Dean, School of Basic Sciences, Assam Kajima University, Dr. Dimple Jyoti Mohanta and his colleagues, Department of Mathematics and Department of Basic Sciences, uh, Kajima University, Dr. Manjil Saikia, Dr. Gautam Kolita, Dr. Kolita, I suppose he will be the speaker today. So uh, I express my heartiest, my heartiest thanks for your this endeavor, for this effort. So I particularly I thank uh, the School of Basic Sciences, Assam Kajiranga University, for their efforts to promote uh, science and scientific temperament in uh, not only in the locality, in the area where the university is situated, but across the state and across the country. And today, they have proved that their efforts has gone beyond the country, okay? And internationally, even they are hosting. So definitely, I applaud. I also like to uh, appreciate Gonit Sora. So for Gonit Sora, the efforts of Gonit Sora to generate uh, mathematical awareness among the students and teachers, and uh, bringing mathematics and mathematicians to the reach of learners on these online platforms during this very difficult situation of this pandemic times. It's uh, really a very adorable and uh, appreciable effort. I thank Konichara and uh, Asam Kajinonga University for the efforts of bringing all of us here today. Uh, a few words about my understanding of uh, uh, fundamental mathematics. So two basic, basic notions, I mean, which are, I feel that they are taboos, is that uh, one is that only brilliant students do mathematics. And the other one, because good students come to do mathematics so they can learn on their own. I feel that both are taboos, both are on wrong, wrong uh, I mean, uh, standards. So they are wrong, wrong notions. Uh, see, uh, so actually, if you see that not everyone, what we call brilliant, okay? brilliance, of course, that's, that's a very relative term. But unless someone is very brilliant, so-called brilliant, one should not go for mathematics. It is not brilliance, question of brilliance. It is question of likings. Okay? Liking a subject, liking music. Even, even someone is, may not be very good in, I mean, performing music, but one can appreciate music and actually, then one can learn. So of, of his kind of, or her kind of music, one can learn. So, so is mathematics. There is a, uh, you see that there is a conspicuous gap. I mean, if you see that it is not only in our country, across the globe, there's a conspicuous gap between the school mathematics and college mathematics. Okay, there is a quantum jump. And we feel that because only brilliant students, they go for doing higher mathematics, so they will learn on their own. It's a very wrong concept. There should be some helping hands. Okay, there should be, some efforts so that that gap is overcome by the students who want to pursue mathematics. Okay? So these fundamental ideas, they should be introduced in such a way that the students can, not only they can learn, okay? that learning should be joyful. Not only that, they should be able to invent, they should be able to discover. Not necessarily it's something new which is not existing. Whatever is existing, there should be some, some opportunity for the student to discover from, from small, small things. So through discovery, they learn how to discover and do more mathematics. Okay. So I think uh, I should not take much. So I'd like uh, to hope, I mean, definitely I hope that this series of talks will give the audience joy of learning, some of the beautiful notions of I mean, mathematics, 
fundamental matrix in, in the ideas of number theory, combinatorics, differential equations. So these are beautiful subjects with beautiful uh, notions and beautiful results and beautiful applications. Okay. So I wish all the best. I thank all the uh, young mathematicians coming forward to deliver talks in this series. Okay. I wish all success. So I thank again the organizers for giving me chance to speak in these few words. Thank you. All. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your beautiful words. I also thank sir for giving us your valuable time for the second day too. Thank you so much, sir. Now we have Dr. Monjil Soikya, the managing editor of Ganitra as well as the research associate of Cardiff University to kindly continue this session from this point. Monjil, please continue. Thank you, uh, Dr. Monjil. Um, before going into the main talk, uh, very briefly, I'd like to say a few words. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Kaziranga University, especially uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor P.K. Mishra, uh, the Dean of Basic Sciences, Professor Zoyanto Sarma, who is with us today, and uh, uh, the School of Basic Sciences family, uh, especially Dr. Dimpal Mohanta, uh, who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes uh, to, for making this program a success. Uh, I also thank uh, Professor Bhavo Sarma, who has kindly uh, given us his time, not only yesterday, but also today, and for his uh, motivating and uh, kind words. Um, so uh, I also thank uh, the speaker, Dr. Gautam Kolita, who is uh, again with us today uh, as well, so for giving his valuable time again for, for the benefit of the participants. Um, before I go to the introduction and the, and the talk, so let me just mention that uh, if there are any questions during the talk, please use the chat option uh, and uh, send us the question and at the end of the talk, we'll forward it to the speaker. So please uh, do not overload the chat with unnecessary messages because then it is easy uh, for the genuine questions to get lost. So please only ask uh, questions and not use the chat for unnecessary messages. Um, thank you. So let me just introduce uh, Dr. Gautam Kolita. Uh, Dr. Kolita is now an assistant professor uh, in uh, IIIT Guwahati. Uh, he did his BSc from Bozali College and then he went to Tespur University to do his MSc, where he also did his uh, PhD and he completed his PhD in 2014. Uh, Dr. Kolita's uh, research work is broadly in the areas of number theory, algebra, and cryptography. And today he's going to speak about uh, number theory in cryptography. So welcome, uh, Dr. Kolita. Please uh, take us from there. Uh, thank you, Manjil, uh, for the kind words. And uh, congratulations to Assam Kajiranga University, all the family of uh, Assam Kajiranga University and Ganitsara for holding this uh, webinar. And um, thank you, Baba Kumar Sarma, sir, for glad this occasion. So, um, I'll just uh, today talk about a fundamental topic of uh, mathematics, which is basically number theory, and uh, just talk about some applications of number theory in cryptography systems. And most of us actually gone through the most of the cryptography system without knowing. So in this talk, I'll try to just uh, explain how these different crypto systems are actually using in our day-to-day -day life, even ordering about them and uh, the number theory those are used in our know, cryptography crypto systems and if i need to talk whatever number theory uh, we are actually doing number theory from our class one whatever we are doing most of the things are based on number theory but even though we do not bother whether those are number theory but later on when we go to um, specialization in our graduation then only know that these are the mathematics that we studied and we go into more detail about those topics so the overview of my talk would be basically let's start with what is number theory, how why those are important, what is cryptography, what are the tools those are used, what are the tools of number theory those are used in cryptography, why cryptography is important for us, then the number theoretical tool those are used for certain uh, particular cryptography systems, and uh, actually there are many crypto systems which are in our day to day life, but it is not possible to discuss about all the cryptography systems and all uh, mathematical tools those are used in those crypto systems. I'll just talk about certain topics which are used in certain cryptography systems. And then I'll just um, try to demonstrate how those number theoretical tools are used in uh, 
the two different kind of crypto system called private key crypto systems and public key crypto systems with uh, examples of certain uh, particular affine cipher hill cipher rsa crypto system and algamal crypto systems where different number theoretical tools are used in uh, those crypto systems and i'll try to explain or try to mention certain attacks used on those crypto systems and uh, discuss about their security as well so before going to the main uh, crypto systems and cryptography let me tell what is number theory is and we already know number theory is a part of mathematics is a branch of mathematics so the mathematics is so much important that galileo stated that mathematics is the language with which god has written the universe that means uh, we can uh, i can we can understand how much important the mathematics is for our day to day life if god has used it for uh, creating the universe and most of us knew galileo galileo is uh, the great mathematician philosopher astronomer physicist so he stated that all mathematic all physical phenomenon uh, available in our surrounding can be expressed in terms of mathematical language right and according to gauss uh, the one of the branches of mathematics which is number theory is more important compared to the other mathematical uh, other branches of mathematics that's why he uh, stated that mathematics is the queen of sciences and number theory is the queen of mathematics right so there are many branches of mathematics which have many practical applications but number theory is the most important part of mathematics in terms of now it is in terms of application as well as it's uh, because of its purity as well now if i need to tell what is number theory is in um, simple language number theory is actually a branch of mathematics which you used to study the natural numbers natural numbers 1 2 3 or sometimes zero is also included the natural numbers or we can extend it to the study of integers this is basically the ancient idea of uh, number theory the number theory basically deals with the integers but the number the modern number theory is not restricted to the set of integers it basically deals with those sets most of the sets which are actually uh, have uh, properties similar to the integers so that's why the set of rational numbers set of real numbers and set of complex numbers also comes into play in number theory in certain cases basically uh, the results of number theory can be proved easily sometimes sometimes uh, the results of number theory can be proved easily for the integers by extending those to some uh, complex numbers or real numbers or rational numbers but in this talk i'll not talk about the other sets which are used in number theory but i'll basically restrict myself to the study of integers because most of the crypto systems use the integers only because of their bit representations finite bit representations so what is the importance of this number theory is number theory is uh, if somebody says before 1950 somebody asked this question before 1950 or around that uh, it can be seen that number theory has not seen as a so much practicable mathematics so it was considered as the purest of mathematics without much of application and that's why dickson says that thank god the number theory is unsolved by any application that means it no it is not made any um, it is not used for application nobody is thinking about application part keep on studying the mathematics so that is its beauty and then gh hardy stated that real mathematics has no effect on war and no one has yet discovered any wild like situation to be solved by the theory of numbers and gh hardy uh, is a person is basically was a uh, advisor of uh, ramanujan at cambridge uh, when he, ramanujan visited uh, cambridge and gh hardy is a person of world war 1 so that's why he has seen a lot of uh, destruction to the world with the help of uh, the invention or discoveries of uh, sciences but he has not seen any application of number theory in those ways but the scenario has changed a lot now the number theory is no more uh, a, a purest branch of mathematics but it has more application nowadays and the uh, number theory can make a wild like situation which is more dangerous nowadays because of the cyber crime the cyber crimes basically happens Uh, with the knowledge of number theory which are used by uh, computer scientists and for computer scientists the number theory becomes the most important tool 
and it is used for different uh, areas of computer science called algorithm, artificial intelligence, and cryptography, which is the most important, uh, which is demanding uh, topics of computer science. So I'll not discuss about the algorithm and artificial intelligence part in this uh, talk, but I'll just mention about, or I'll just talk about the cryptography part here. So if I need to go to cryptography, what do you mean by cryptography? So cryptography is actually a branch of cryptology, which actually studies the methods of sending messages or some information uh, via insecure signal. Insecure signal means it may be a internet, it may be a telephone, right? So this telephone or internet are not considered as a secure signal, but these are insecure signal. That means some advisory can uh, attack on this and get uh, information through this internet or insecure signal. Right. So, the cryptography basically deals with sending uh, important messages through insecure signal in a uh, particular form. Particular form means in encrypted form or disquisite form. It means it is not the original message, but in a different form of the original message, which is sent through the insecure signal, so that the recipient who is supposed to get the message can get it and obtain the original message, but no one else or the attacker cannot get the information. Remember that the cryptography is one of the branches of cryptology. Then there is another branch of cryptology which is called cryptoanalysis. And the cryptoanalysis always deals with the methods to uh, crack a crypto system. That means cryptography and cryptology, crypto analysis are quite different, are completely different branches of cryptology. One uh, discuss about the security, another try to break the security. That means crypto analysis is used to check the security of a crypto system. Right? Up Until a crypto up. analysis is used to create a crypto system, it is considered as a secure crypto system. Okay. So therefore, cryptography is actually a science of accessing information. And there are two aspects mainly. One is privacy. Privacy means that uh, I think that uh, I want to share the information with whom. Devs only can get the information. And authentication, that means who is going to send the message. That means from the aspect of sender and from the aspect of uh, receiver, the uh, secrecy should be maintained in cryptography. The basic setup of a crypto system is uh, like this, gra uh, this diagram. If Alice is a sender who sends, supposed to send a message X, and Bob is the receiver who's supposed to get the message, and Oscar is an attacker or advisory who's supposed to um, uh, get it, get the message, even though he's not supposed to get it. Right? That means at least do not want that Oscar get the message, but Oscar's try to steal the message somehow through the insecure sender. So in this system, at least send a message X by encrypting it. That means X is the original message, but he will use a function called encryption function to um, get another form of that message that is Y, which is encrypted text or cipher text, and that Y is sent to the insecure signal, then Bob will receive the Y, that means encrypted or cipher text, and use the decryption function. Decryption function is actually, in some sense, the inverse of the encryption function to get the original message, okay? So if Oscar get the Y, somehow suppose Oscar gets Y, the cipher text, and if he does not know the decryption function, then he will not get able to get the original message. Okay. So, and in this process, there is one important part that is the key, right? So the key plays the main role. So key is something which is basically uh, agreed upon by the sender and recipient uh, in advance. They are agreed with some kind of number or some kind something that on which they are supposed to be agreed. Okay. And the key sometimes is sent to a secure signal, okay, and sometimes it is or this also can be sent to an insecure signal. So if it is sent to a secure signal, then we call it a public key, private key crypto system. And if it is not sent to a secure signal, it is called basically a public key crypto system. I'll just discuss that later on one by one. Okay. So now, what do you mean by encryption function? Encryption function is a one-one function from the set of all possible plain text messages. I can consider the plain text messages as A, B, C, D. These are the plain text message units in single digits. 
or if it is two digit then a b a c these blocks will be uh, the plain text message in diagram and so on basically and cipher text means the mm, numbering that we do like if i want to give a number a to one that means one is the uh, i can say it is a cipher text one two three those are the cipher text i can consider so this function f will take a one one is a bijection function from the set of plain text to the cipher text okay and the, the ciphering function is nothing but the inverse of that in ciphering function so there is a direct relation of this in ciphering with the deciphering function most of the cases and sometimes this is not possible to get the deciphering function directly from the in ciphering function so we'll talk about them later on but before using any crypto system the first thing is to level the crypto the plain texts these levels are given like one two three so on or if it is diagram it is given one to up to 728 or 729 if zero is not considered and zero is considered zero to 728 so suppose if i want to send through a diagram suppose a b and if i name a to be one and b to be two then uh, the leveling of a b the diagram would be 27 into 1 plus 2 that means that would be 29 29 is the leveling of the diagraph ab and so on others also can be done so in general if one wants to work with k letters block with n letter alphabet then the numbering will be from 0 to n power k minus 1 this leveling so these are and sometimes we generally use uh, objects like vectors uh, points matrices to uh, level plain texts as well now, why this cryptography is important? And remember, the cryptography is actually uh, based on the principle, which is called soft principle, which says that the crypto system should be secure even if the attacker knows all the details about the crypt system, with the exception of the secret key. That means, that means uh, the crypto system when it, when one when crypto system is used, one supposed to know all the details of the crypto system, like what kind of um, um, system like what kind of whether it is a single message uh, letters are used or diagraphs are used or matrices or the vectors are used even if a person knows all these things without knowing the secret key one should not able to get the messages that are shown sent to so insecure signal using the crypto system okay and the crypto systems are or cryptography was uh, in ancient time was used basically for military and diplomatic purposes in warlike situation to send secret messages okay but nowadays it is not like that with the use of uh, internet so much internet and uh, internet banking uh, online shopping use of whatsapp facebook the um in the cryptography or crypto like crypto systems becomes a fire um, important part of our life without knowing okay so if you look at the uh, whatsapp that we use then whatsapp it is already written that calls and videos are encrypted so that nobody can get the message and even nowadays there is a advertisement of whatsapp that your messages are 100 percent encrypted right so this encryption are generally used using the cryptography or crypto systems and without knowing those we basically using them we do not bother about those crypto system which are used in our day-to-day -day life whether in our messaging or in our um, online shoppings when we give the our bank details all these things okay and all these crypto system not all basically most of the crypto system there's are in use nowadays generally uh, uses uh, number theory okay so i'll just discuss about those a certain number theory tools which are used in certain particular cryptography crypto systems so the number theory if i need to start with the number theory the number theory actually start with the uh, euclid's algorithm right so i'll talk about them but before that let me think a problem where the crypto system can be used so suppose i want to send um, or a merchant or a bank wants to know my credit card i have a credit card and i want to send the detail of the credit card to a bank right through an insecure signal maybe a telephone or maybe internet through internet i want to send so that 
another person cannot get the information or my credit card number right so if i send the original number credit card number through the internet then there is always a possibility that a third person or an attacker or advisor always has a possibility to to uh, get that entire credit card number and can use it for uh, his interest right so therefore we need to send the message in such a way even though attacker get the message should not get the credit card number but the merchant or the bank should able to crack the original credit card number with the help of a ciphering message okay so this can be given by the merchant the merchant may tell you that uh, just use this technique or may suggest you some technique to send that message or credit your credit card number through a in ciphering so using some uh, technique to send the original credit card number to some other number and these are actually used using two kinds of crypto system one is public private crypto system which is also called symmetric crypto system another is called public crypto system which is called asymmetric crypto system why the public private crypto system is called symmetric because if one knows the in ciphering function we have that we define then he or she can directly obtain the in deciphering function as well directly but in public crypto system even if one knows the in ciphering key will not able to or in ciphering function he or she will not able to get the deciphering function without having much knowledge about the whole system okay so in public key crypto system there are two kinds of keys are used one is pub, private key crypto public key another is public key but in private key crypto system there is only one kind of key is used that is public key okay and all the in this both the crypto system the properties of integers congruences and different numerical aspects like uh, quadratic residues uh properties of integer their extension group structure field structure these are already used in cryptography so before going to this two crypto systems one by one i'll just deal with the basic number theory things uh, or fundamental number theory those are used in those crypto systems and the number theory that or the number theory that i will just discuss here may be in a abstract way but most of us already knew know about this all crypto all number theory i begin with the division algorithm uh based on which the whole number theory actually uh develops okay? so the division algorithm is already known to all of us we used in the class 3 or 4 but it states for any integer a and b if b is not equal to 0 then there exist two numbers uh quotient and remainder q and r respectively such that a is equal to bq plus r where r is, can be 0 or it is less than mod of b i have given the mod because i am considering i am allowing b to be a negative integer as well right and if i do not allow b to be a negative integer i can remove this mod part as well so here a is divided and b is divisor q is question and r is called the remainder and if r is equal to 0 then we can write a is equal to bq and in that case we say that uh, a is divis A is divided by B, or B is a divisor of A. But if R is not equal to zero, then A will not be divisible by B. Right? There is certain remainder will be there. And one can directly verify that the divisibility is an equivalence relation. That means it is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive as well. Right? And it has many other properties as well. That means if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides the linear combination of B and C, which is actually used. a lot improving many properties of the integers okay okay and the division algorithm is used to prove many properties of integers like i have given examples like 3a square minus 1 is never a perfect square right and this can be used that if one has to be a perfect square it has to be one of the form chi square plus 1 right but if you write 3a square uh, 3k or 3k plus 1 but you cannot write 3a square minus 1 in the form thai square plus 1 or thai square it will be of the form thai square plus 2 so any number of the form thai square can never thai square plus 2 can never be a perfect square which can be proved using the division algorithm similarly the sequence 11111111 and so on the sequence will also not have any perfect square because the numbers will be of the form 4k plus 3 all numbers because 11 is 4 into 2 plus 3 111 is 4 uh 
4 into 27 plus 3 and so on. So all numbers are of the form 4k plus 3 and there is no integers of the form 4k plus 3 which are perfect square. So these are certain simple applications of the division algorithm. And division algorithm is also used to find the ZCD, the greatest common divisor. So greatest common divisor means it is the largest divisor of any two integers. Generally, without loss of generality, we can consider that A and B are two positive integers as well. So the largest common divisors of A and B is called the ZCD. We generally found the ZCD is using the factorization, but uh, for the factorization, uh, generally for larger number, it's not so easy to do the factorization, but we use the divisor algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of any integers. Right? Because it is basically, it takes less time comparative to the factorization for a large number. Even though in our primary or high school, we use the factorization techniques for smaller integers. Okay. And the most important property of the greatest common divisors is that if I have two numbers A and B, their greatest common divisor, GCD of AB, always can be expressed as a linear combination of these two numbers A and B. Okay. And because of this, uh, uh, the GCDs are used uh, to solve Diophantine equation. That means equations in um, uh, the set of integers, or even these are used in cryptography systems as well. Okay, but this statement, the theorem is not uh, uh, a fan on lip condition. That means the GCD can be expressed as a linear combination of A and B, but if any number linear combination of A and B may not be a GCD but it can be a multiple of the GCD, okay? So these are the properties actually that GCD has, even though there are many properties, but I'm stating those properties which can be used. So this theorem, one is basically used on most of the crypto system which uses number theory, okay? And if we use the division algorithm uh, repeatedly, uh, we can find the GCD, which is called Euclidean algorithm, and the ZCD also can be expressed in terms of the, the number A and B using this Euclidean algorithm. So what is this Euclidean algorithm is, suppose you need to find the ZCD of any two numbers A and B. Then I can use the ZCD, uh, I can use the division algorithm where A will be divided by B, which becomes A is equal to BQ1 plus R1. Then if R1 is zero, then automatically I can read the ZCD. The ZCD of A and B would be B. But if R1 is not equal to zero, then I can divide this B again by R1. And then I get a remainder R2, right? And this process, until I get a zero remainder, I can continue, right? And it is bounded, I'll get a zero remainder. Because if you look at the sequence of the remainders, like R1, R2, R3, up to Rn, this is a decreasing sequence of integers, right? And this is always smaller than B. So there are always finitely many numbers smaller than B or finitely many positive integers smaller than B. So this, there is always a bound that the zero remainder always appears at some time, okay? So in this, uh, if you use the division algorithm repeatedly, which is called Euclidean algorithm, then the last non-zero reminder R1 is the ZCD of this A and B because of the lemma which states that if A is equal to BQ plus R, then ZCD of AB is same as ZCD of B and R. So from the last step, I can say that R1, R1, N, uh, Rn is the GCD of Rn minus one and Rn, right? And that GCD will be same as GCD of Rn minus two and Rn minus two. And if I go backward, I'll see that this will be same as the GCD of A and B. So that means the last non-zero remainder Rn is actually the GCD of A and B. And the same uh, division algorithm, division algorithm or Euclidean algorithm can be used to find the number Rn as a linear combination of A and B, okay? So how this can be done, just simply is just looking at Rn, from the last statement if I do, Rn can be expressed as Rn minus one minus Rn minus two Qn, right? Then I replace this Rn minus n again from the previous line again, that will become Rn minus three minus Rn minus two Qn minus one, and so on until I get A and B, I can, I keep on replacing one by one the remainders. And finally, I'll get the ZCD of A and B as a linear combination of A and B. So I've given an example here where I have taken to large number one, two, three, seven, eight, and three, zero, five, four. This also can be done using factorization, but factorization may not be so suitable 
because it may take um, it, more time to find a factorization. Okay, and in number theory, we can we assume that the factorization law is impossible or is not feasible for a large number, sufficiently large number. So if I use the divisional here, I get six equations, and from the six equation, I see that six is the last non-zero last non-zero reminder. So six is the city of these two numbers, and the six can be expressed as a linear combination of one, two, three, seven, eight, and three, zero, five, four. In this way, by replacing, just you look at six can be represented in twenty-four minus eighteen. Then this eighteen will be replaced from this one thirty-eight minus five into twenty-four. Okay, which is simplified to get six into twenty-four minus one thirty-eight. Then twenty-four will be replaced six into one sixty-two minus one thirty-eight, and so on. I can do to get the linear combination. So that's how this ECD can be expressed as a linear combination of those two numbers using the Euclidean algorithm. Okay. So the next thing that we need in cryptography is a number theory. This is the most important part in any cryptographic systems. The number theory plays the primary role. In any number, any crypto system which uses number theory, okay. So the number theory, the prime numbers, we already know these are actually numbers which do not have any proper divisors. The only divisors are plus minus one and plus minus p. And remember that one is neither considered as a prime number nor considered as a composite number. So that's why I've taken p is bigger than one. Okay. So any number which is not prime is also called composite. Composite. Right? And the prime numbers are very interesting. Why these are interesting? Because small polar numbers, it's quite easy to check the primality or whether a number is a prime or not by checking the divisors. Suppose n is a number, we check the divisors up to root n. If there is a divisor up to root n, then we can say that it is a composite. Otherwise, it is not prime. Otherwise, it is prime. But if it is a large number, if I take a, a sixteen-digit number, we generally use as computers, by is used by computers. So it is not be easy to get. All the check the all divisibility. It is always time consuming. It takes a lot of time to check that. So therefore, the primality is always a concern, right? So therefore, it is always a problem whether one can give a feasible way to find uh, whether a number is a prime or not. Okay, and even if it is prime, it, uh, even if it is not a prime, the factorization is again more difficult compared to that. Okay. Uh, that's what generally it is assumed by uh, that is has been proved generally in computer also bigger number checking primality is always a problem and even it is known that it is not a prime the factorization is again a uh, is more difficult okay so therefore uh, it allows us to use prime numbers in cryptography because of these two facts but there are certain probability methods using the euler theorem or rose method there are many methods um, Algorithmic method to check the primality, but these methods cannot guarantee. These are some probability. That means it will give a probability that what is the probability that number can not be prime, or what is the probability that number can be a prime, and these are actually enough for computer scientists to use them in cryptography. Okay, so I'm not dealing with this primality testing methods or factorization methods as well. There are many factorization methods like Fermat's factorization. And um, container fraction factorization methods. There are many methods that are used, but for bigger number, these are also this also fails to implement using computers. Okay. So uh, the fund, uh, the prime numbers actually plays the role of building building blocks for all natural numbers. Why? Because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that any positive integer can be expressed as a product of prime powers. And this represent is always unique except the order of the prime factors. Okay. And this already we know that uh, when I find a ZCD, we always try to find the factorization of any number and then try to find the common numbers. And this is because the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. But even though the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is there theoretically, but it is not easy to factorize, right? So it may take very long time to factorize a large integer. Right, so it is a easier. It is easier for a smaller number, but for a bigger number, a defactorization not actually uh, computationally feasible in computer. Okay. But there are some applications of fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Uh, one is in the Euler phi function. Euler phi function is also used 
in crypto system. So Euler phi function is basically counts the number of co prime numbers to n. If I need to check n is any number, and if I need to find the number of co prime numbers less than n, then phi n will give you the number of co prime numbers, positive co prime numbers, obviously. And the formula for phi n or Euler phi function for any integer is one if n is one, and this n minus one if n minus if n is a prime because all numbers smaller than a prime are co-prime to n. And if n is composite, then we can uh, use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic to factorize it. And then this formula will give you the number of co-prime numbers to n. Okay. And note that 3000 uh, is a composite number, obviously. This is the factorization, this factorization. And then using this formula, I can say that there are 800 co-prime numbers less than 3000. Okay. And moreover, defect prime uh, number factorization can be used to find the number of divisors, where tau is the number of divisors of 3000. It can be seen that there are 32 divisors of 3000. And uh, the, uh, this one will give you the sum of all divisors. That means the sum of these 32 divisors is 9360. So these are the general formula for the divisor function and sum of divisor functions. Even though we are not using the divisor function and some of the divisor function in our cryptography system, but we will uh, use a uh, Euler uh, function for our cryptographic use. So then, the most uh, or the important one of the important topics of number theory which are used in cryptographic system is the congruences. So we have discussed two already. One is the division algorithm and GCD. Another is the prime number, and third is the congruences. So the congruences are generally uh, introduced by Gauss in his famous book, in first chapter itself. What it says that if n is any positive integer, two numbers or in two integers a and b are said to be uh, congruent to each other in modulo n, congruence modulo n, if the difference of a and b, that means a minus b or b minus a, is divisible by n. Okay, and from here you can see that. Using division algorithm, if I write a is equal to n cube plus r, then a would be congruence to r mod n, as well as a is congruence to r mod q. For example, if you take 10 and suppose uh, 15, then 10 is congruence to 15 mod 5, because 10 minus 15 is minus 5, which is divisible by 5. Similarly, if you take 17 and 3, 17 and 3 is congruence modulo 7, because 17 minus 3 is 14, so 14 is divisible by 7. Okay, so that's how the congruence comes into play. And there are many applications of this, uh, or many properties of the congruences are the, the basic, uh, or I can say, uh, congruence properties uh, form an equivalence relation. Right? So it is uh, reflexive, symmetric, and uh, um, what I can say is transitive as well. And therefore, they form a partition from the set of natural numbers, the residue classes or I can say equivalent classes 0, 1, 2, and minus 1. So zero equivalence class means it is the set of all numbers which will give remainder 0, 1 is divided by n. Okay, equivalence class 1 means the set of all integers which will give you remainder 1 when divided by n, and so on, right? And if I consider a set of all remainders 0 up to n minus 1, which is denoted by Zn, right? This is the set of all uh, least non-negative residues modulo n, this is called complete set of residues, and one can check that Zn is a group with respect to addition modulo n. Okay, and Zn is a group with respect to multiplication modulo n. If we remove the zero, and n is considered to be n is considered to be a prime number. Okay, then it becomes a, a group with respect to multiplication as well, because all elements of Zn will not have multiplicative inverse. The elements which will be co-prime to n will have only multiplicative inverse. And it is one of the uh, basic uh, properties of the definition of group, okay? So the elements which are co-prime to n will have only uh, inverses in modulo n, multiplicative inverse in modulo n. But with respect to addition, all will have inverse. A will have the inverse n minus A. So thus there are phi n multiplicate elements which will have inverse. That means phi n units in Zn. So you can see that seven 
has an inverse in modulo 9, which is 4, because the CD of 7 and 9 is 1, and I can write 7 into 4 plus 9 into minus 3 is 1. If I take modulo 9, ultimately it becomes 7 into 4 is congruence to 1. So 4 will be inverse of 7, and 7 is also inverse 4. But 3 and 6 will not have any inverse in modulo 9, because 3 and 6 are not um, co-prime to 9. Okay, but if P is prime, all elements will have inverse modulo n because all elements smaller than P will be co-prime to P. So this uh, logic can be used uh, in proving the Euler's theorem as well. What Euler's theorem states that if A and N are two co-prime numbers, the GCD is one, then A power phi N is always congruent to one mod N. Okay, so that means A power phi N, that, that means in 3000, I found uh, 530, right? So 530 is 848, I guess. So then A power, if you take any A, which is co-prime to 3000, right? If you take any three, any A co-prime to 3000, and if you take the power 848, then it will always give you congruence one mod 3000 by the Euler's theorem. Okay? So if N is a prime number, then phi, P is always P minus one, then Euler's theorem give us a, a corollary, which give it a Fermat's little theorem, which says that A power P minus one is congruent to one mod P always, where P does not divide A. Because if P does not divide A, ultimately P and A become co-prime. Okay? So that means for any number, if you take any integer, there is always a number which will give you congruent to one mod that number, right? And this idea, or uh, the theorem of Euler's and Fermat's Dittier theorem motivates wants to define the primitive elements of any integer, right? So now what do you mean by primitive elements? Before getting to the primitive elements, we need to know the order of an element. So what do you mean by an order of an integer in modulo n? So if n is any positive integer and a is any number co-prime to n, then the order of A, modulo N, is the smallest positive integer K, such that A power K is congruent to one mod N, okay? So that means, suppose I'm taking A is equal to two, and N is equal to, suppose, uh, seven, right? So I'll keep on taking the power of two. Two, first one is two power one, then two power two, four. Four is not congruent to one mod seven. But when I take two cube, K is equal to three, that is two cube is congruent to two cube is eight. Eight is congruent to one mod seven, right? So that means three is the order of two mod seven. But there are more numbers. But three is the smallest number. If you take six power, that is also one. Nine power is also one. But three is the least positive integer, which will give you congruent one mod seven to two, right? So for any prime, the elements of ZP star, that means all non-zero elements having the order P minus one, because all elements may not have order P minus one. So if you see the Euler's theorem or um, Fermat's little theorem, A P power A power P minus one or A power phi n is always congruent to one, right? But phi A P minus P minus one may not be the smallest integer. There may be some smaller number than P minus one, which may be congruent to one more P. Right? That may be the possibility that it can happen. Like uh, in this example that I have taken, n is equal to seven, right? n is equal to seven, which is a prime, so p minus one is six. So that means two power six is congruent to one, but six is not the least number which is congruent to one mod seven, right? So in that way, uh, it may not be possible. There may be smaller number to p minus one, which will give you congruence to one. So therefore, all elements of the three star may not be have order p minus one. But those elements which will have order p minus one are called primitive elements or primitive roots of zp or generator of zp star because zp star is a multiplicative group modulo p. I'm not discussing about what is group is. We'll not bother about that here. Maybe. So if z is a primitive element of zp, then if you take all the possible powers, right? That z, z power zero, z power one, z power two, so on up to infinity, then it will give you zp star, right? And if you look at, I have written up to z, z power p minus two, because if you write the next term, z p minus one, which will be congruent to one more p, right? By the Fermat's little theorem. So ultimately the same thing will repeat after that. So even if you can take power up to infinity, since z is a primitive root, 
after certain time, the same thing will repeat. So that means you will get the say ZP star, which is a finite set actually with P minus one elements. And one can see that there are five power phi P minus one primitive elements in ZP. And it is not quite difficult for a smaller number, uh, 39, 29, if I take Z 29, it is easy to check the two, three, eight, 12, up to 27, these 12 are the primitive roots, okay? So these all elements have order 28. Okay? But others, if you take one, one has order one. If you take four, that will have order less than 28. Okay, maybe 14, I guess. So that's all other elements will not have order P minus one, that means 28, but these elements will order 28. And these are 12, 12, 12 such numbers. Okay. So these are the basic mathematics that we use or we need to discuss certain cryptographic system. Uh, please note, what the thing that we have discussed is uh, Euclidean algorithm, ZCD, prime numbers, right? Congruences, Euler's theorem, and primitive roots. These are the six main topics or main tools that we use or that will be used in the cryptographic systems that we'll discuss in this talk. Okay. So now let me discuss about some private key crypto systems or symmetric crypto system. So the most oldest method, and actually before using this crypto systems, there's in this one story that uh, uh, before the crypto systems, the kings supposed to send some secret messages during wars. What they did, they basically saved a certain messenger, uh, their hairs and write the message on their head and um, wait till their uh, hairs grow. And then the messenger is sent to the other king or to send a message. If somebody catch that messenger, they will check everything, but it is possible that uh, the attacker will not check his head because hairs are already there, right? But other person who already know that the king will send in that way the message, will save the messenger again and look at the message, right? But if this technique is known to someone else, then the same process cannot be used to send it messages, right? So that's why the ancient king also used crypto systems some way. But in modern way, number theory is used, like the one of the method is used by Julius Caesar, uh, which is basically sift uh, messages by some letters. Like A is replaced by D, B is replaced by E, C is replaced by F, and similarly Z will be replaced by C. That means three letters shifted to write. And in that way, Doodle will encrypt it because by this function f of x is equal to x plus b, the message Doodle, if somebody wants to send a message Doodle, he will send G R R G O H. Right? And if somebody gets the message G R R G O H, since the function is f is x plus b the inverse function would be f inverse x, x minus b. That means once getting that message, encrypted message, the recipient will just see the letters, three letters left, right? Then automatically it'll get doodle. So similarly, one can check the if one gets the encrypted message x, k, f, j, x, i, you will see the message three letters left and ultimately get the message animal, which is the original message one's supposed to get. But the defect here is there are some defects of this method is that if somebody knows the encryption process, that means if knows f, x is equal to x plus b, like in the problem of uh, uh, the credit card that I started with, suppose the uh, Marcin tells me that please encrypt the credit card number using this crypto system, okay? Then what I can do? I can encrypt, I can send a message. But if I get, I already know the function s, f, right? So if I get some encrypted, uh, uh, um, credit card number of someone else, I can use the function to get the inverse and get the original credit card number for others as well, right? So that means getting the function f actually can get the original message from the encrypted function as well. Okay, the sender and receiver both will know the encryption function and the decryption function in this kind of system. Next, Drawback is that if one knows the exact shift amount, right? And even if the function is not known, still one can attack. Why? Because 
in letters, how many letters are there? 26 letters, right? So how many ways I can sift? At most 26 ways, right? After 26, if I write 27, which is same as sifting one, correct? If I sift the letter A up to 27, which is B, and if I sift one, that is also B. So since there are only 76 possibilities, the search space is very small. So computer can always use it to crack the function. Okay, that is the second drawback. The third drawback is that uh, in language, actually what happened, there is a statistical survey or statistical interpretation of letters which are most, uh, which are used frequently. That means in English uh, language, it has been uh, proved that certain letters appear more frequently, like the T, T is used most frequently. Then E is a second frequent letter in English language. So if one gets a longer message, cipher message, if I can get a cipher message, right? I'm a attacker, suppose. I get a longer message, and I'll see what are the letters that are uh, awkward more frequently in that long message. So whatever long message that will appear, I can assume that that letter will correspond to T. And the next second long, uh, second frequently number will correspond to E. Okay, so the language uh, analysis will tell me the two siftings always. So once I know two siftings, ultimately there is only one unknown B. So since there is only one unknown B, two equations are more than enough to get this B key. Their key is actually B is a key, which is unknown. Okay. So to overcome the second one, second uh, the search space twenty six. There is a more generalization that is done, which is called affine cipher, which is AX, AX plus B. So AX plus B, there is a uh, scaling is also used. Here, one can see that the N has to be co-prime to A. If A is not co-prime, the deciphering function will not exist. What is the deciphering function here? One can assume is that A inverse X minus B, right? Because Y is equal to AX plus B, then X will be A inverse Y minus B. And this A inverse in modulo N will exist only if A is co-prime to N, right? So that's why this CD will come into play. And there are how many? There are basically phi N into N such SIFR functions will be there. So that means it will increase the uh, size of such space. But even though it is done, I can check this that I have given an example as well here with this. But even though the first and third drawback of Caesar cipher is still there. Okay, that means knowing the encryption function will allow to decrypt a function. And the frequency analysis statistical letters will tell you there are now there are two unknowns, A and B, which are keys of this affine cipher. And if I do two equations, I'll explain in the next slide basically, I can get it. What it says, suppose in 26 letters, suppose most frequently occurred letter in cipher text is K. I have created a message. Suppose I have got a message, cipher text, a long cipher text, and I have seen that K appears uh, most frequently, and the second most is D. And since already a uh, linguist researcher has found that E is the most frequently um, appeared letter in English, and T is the next, so one can assume that the K actually corresponds E and T corresponds D. So from this affine cipher, I can get an equation 11a plus b is congruent to 5 mod 26, and 4a plus b should be congruent to 20 mod 26, where a and b are unknown still to me. The keys are only known to uh, sender and receiver. But I am a taker. I don't know anything, but I have got the cipher text. Now from these two equations, I can, if I subtract, ultimately I'll get 7a is congruent to 11 mod 26. And from here, one can easily use uh, that 7 and 26 are co-prime. And therefore, one can use the Euclidean algorithm to get the GCD and express the GCD as a linear combination to get the inverse function. Okay, and it can be seen that seven inverse is actually um, fifteen in mod twenty six. So, if I know seven inverse is fifteen, so ultimately a would be equal to nine and b will be equal to eighteen. So that means with the help of cipher text, without knowing the keys, I can get or trick the crypto system in this way, okay? So now if you look at these two crypto systems, there's always drawback, right? But there's one way, the, the single letters, the third drawback, 
that we say is the um, what we say is the statistical analysis right the frequency statistics or letter this can be actually uh, removed by doing digraph crypto systems trigraph or using 50 block crypto systems but the problem in those uh, is that more the size of the uh, blocks the for computers it may not be so easy to easy for computation so one needs to be needs to be careful what should be the size of the blocks so that the computer takes less time to execute it and uh, the attacker will not able to crack it even with the use of frequency statistics so one of the such method can be used using affine cipher as well and can be used using vectors as well right so using vectors the function almost remains as affine cipher where it becomes afx is equal to ax plus b where x is a vector a is a matrix and b is also a matrix or uh, also a factor okay and here the only restriction is that a the determinant of a has to be co prime to n where n is the uh, number of letters in the crypto system okay so what we do here why we need determinant of a to be co prime to get the inverse of a right so the deciphering function would be a inverse x or a inverse y minus b this a inverse exists in modulo n only if determinant of a is con is co prime to n otherwise it will not exist okay okay so in this process what we do suppose i want to um, send a message doodle now okay? already i have sent in single letter uh, in ciphering affine affine um, cipher right the doodle becomes w z z w k the b here you can say w w becomes w j j dollars here uh, the doodle will just block two blocks i'll use digraphs so i'll use do d o o d and l e as three blocks and each block will be represented by three vectors so d o will be represented by 415 i'm using the general notation a is 1 b is 2 c is 3 d is o, 4 so on o d will be 15 4 l e is b 12 5 and i can take any matrix a whose determinant is co prime to 26 so this matrix, if you check what is the determinant, 33 minus 2 is 31, and 31 is co-prime to 26, obviously. Right? So therefore, the inverse exists. Then the ciphering would be just simply taking the function f of do, f of do would be if I use this matrix A3210 multiply with 415 and plus 1, comma 2, it will be 1715, which will be nothing but QO. And f of od would be 29, which is nothing but be, and f of le would be 2117 and uq. So that means the Google will send to two plug on it q, o, b, i, u, q. Right? So now here you can note d and e actually go to the same letters q and e. Right? In um, diagram. Similarly, o's, there are two o's, and two o's goes to different letters. So that means in digraph, same letters may not go to the same letters. A different letter may go to the same letter because the function, the bisection that we talk about in ciphering, actually send digraphs to letters, right? So the digraphs are only considered as one element of the plain text, not the unit uh, single letters. Okay, so that's one one notice. But here again, there is problem is that with the same problem like if I know the ciphering function or as I can crack the secret system by getting the inciphering, uh, deciphering function by taking the inverse of A, which is always possible to get. And second is statistical analysis, but the statistical analysis will fail if we take um, blocks bigger than three, right? Which are quite difficult to break it. But in that way, we need to check the feasibility of the computer as a computationally feasible computer. So that's how one can see that Hill cipher actually avoids some bad features like. Uh, same letter encrypted to the same way in a fun cipher, but here it encrypted a different letter. And frequency analysis of letters, if one uses uh, blocks of bigger than three, but it has problem. Problem in the sense that if one knows the encryption function, it becomes a, one will obviously know the dec uh, decryption function as well. These are equivalent. 
And this is the main drawback of any private key crypto system. Even though keys are kept secret, if one knows the encryption function, decryption function, otherwise you don't. Okay. So therefore, the problem that I started with in encrypting the credit card that is not feasible by using the public key crypto system. Even one use ultimately the if I want to send if the merchant tells me the system ultimately I'll get to know about the whole crypto systems. So obviously again the deciphering function. So I can crack for other credit card as well if I get a deciphered credit card number in that system. Right, so that is a drawback. But there is one uh, modification that can be done by taking different keys for different customers. But that problem is again quite time consuming. Right, and also um, uh, it take uh, it will be called more costlier as well. Okay, and moreover, there are only finitely many such possibilities of keys in n letter. It will be n square at most n square. Right. So therefore, the public private key crypto systems are not so suitable in day-to-day -day life nowadays, where the security is so much essential. So therefore, people use the crypto uh, public key crypto systems. So that's why I've written here the credit card problem. It will not be easy to using the cryptographic system. But if one can get a cryptographic system or crypto system where the merchant tells you that how to encode or how to encrypt the credit card number but still you will not able to decode it right suppose i'm sending the encoding uh, credit card number but even though i know the encoding function or encoding process i'll not able to know i'll not able to dec decode it right without the help of some information which are with only the person okay so that is the main motivation of public crypto system and the public key crypto system is first uh, introduced by defi hellman in 1976 he generally used it to exchange keys like uh, even if you see the public private key crypto systems this a and b these are keys right so the key is supposed to be well agreed before that means this should be agreed through a secure channel that means two person needs to meet to uh, to get the confirmation that they, they will use this keys and each time they want to sense the keys ultimately they need to meet or they need to use a secure channel but secure channel except meeting it is quite difficult to get a secure channel right so that is one again drawback of public key crypto system or private key crypto system so that's why defi hellman actually gave an idea even though uh, there is no secure channel or there is no face-to-face -face meeting still uh, one can sense these keys at any time through a secure insecure channel as well and the attacker will not able to get the keys as well right that is defi hellman key process uh, defi hellman key exchange and that is later on used by lgml to construct a key process about which i'll discuss at the end right the defi hellman um, algorithm is generally used in LGML crypto system. So the main motivation of public key crypto system is that if someone knows only the enciphering function will not able to get the deciphering function. That means enciphering keys cannot be used to find the deciphering keys. That's what the motivation of public key crypto system, which is the draw main drawback of private key crypto system. And in public key crypto system, uh, the basic thing that one needs to use is the trapdoor function. So what is a trapdoor function? Trapdoor function is a function which is easy to compute. Easy to compute, maybe by hand or maybe using computer, but finding inverse is very hard to compute, right? And that's where the prime numbers plays the role and the composite number factorization plays the role. Okay, and those kind of uh, ideas are used here. So if I go to the first crypto system, that is first crypto system that is used by human uh, is the RSA crypto system. The RSA crypto system named after the three uh, 
Karshan, Ron Rivest, Adil Samir, and Leonard Edleman, who discovered it actually in 1977. Even the first uh, public uh, exchange was done by Hefe Elman, but the crypto system was first introduced by uh, uh, Rivest, Samir, and Edleman in 1977. The RSA crypto based on the assumption that a large integer, last positive integer, is not computationally feasible to factor it. That means if you give a large positive integer, it is quite difficult to factorize it. Actually, computationally impossible to factor it. Right? If somebody can find an algorithm to factorize a large prime number in a um, uh, smaller time or in a less time or with using lesser computation, then the RSA crypto system will not work anymore. Okay, so this is the main base of RSA crypto. So far, this uh, this is working on this because the crypto analysis people will not are not able to get the uh, algorithm to find a large prime number computationally phys uh, feasible factorization feasible. Okay. So what is done here in the RSA crypto, the main algorithm is simple. Simple in the sense that just take two large prime numbers, P and Q, okay? So any two prime numbers, P and Q, and this P and Q are taken larger so that the number N, which is product of these two large prime numbers, become very large so that the factorization is not possible computationally. Okay, and the computation, how you demand the computation is actually based on the time complexity, number of bits required to compute, or how much memory a computer uses to do a calculation. And those, those are actually computation the measured. So I'm not going into that. So P and Q are two large numbers. N is the product of two large numbers. So if N, P, U are, Q are large numbers, then ultimately product will also be large. But if P and Q are not, prime numbers, the problem is that they will have smaller uh, factors. So once they have smaller factors, the factorization may be possible, right? So that's why P and Q are taken as the prime numbers. So once P and Q are taken, then the phi function is found. Phi function is nothing but the number of co-prime numbers. And using the factorization of N, ultimately I can get phi P, phi Q, so which is nothing but P minus one into P minus Q minus one. Okay, so always we can find that also. So then the Marcent, Marcent means the banker will um, give a number E, which is co prime to phi n, right? And will tell me to encrypt my credit card number by taking power E to that number, right? Suppose n is the message or the card number, right? If it is a letter, ultimately I can always convert it to um, a number, right? By using American standard uh, ASCII. Or if it is a number itself, then I think I can get M. So M is a number, then I take the power of M power E, right? So M power A in modulo N, obviously, I'll take the modulo N. N is a very large number, so I can take modulo N. So then, I'll send them the message m power e, right? And the numbers e and n will be known to everyone. Known to everyone means everybody will know it. Everybody in the sense that even the attacker, even the sender, everyone, you'll publicly make it uh, available, okay? But other information will not make it. Phi n, you will not make it available. Neither to the sender, neither to the attacker, or no way. Only n and E will make it available, but other information like phi n will not make it available, right? And that is the main uh, thing, phi n pq. If one do not know phi n pq, ultimately will not able to get n. Okay? So m power e will be sent, then the Martian will receive m power e. Then what the Martian will do to get the original message is that since e is a co-prime to phi n, Correct? So one can use the Euclidean algorithm to express uh, one as a linear combination of E and phi n, right? So once 
you get that ultimately i can take modulo phi n here so ultimately i'll get x is congruence to 1 mod 1 right so thus if i need to get m ultimately i take power x x means this x which i have got using the euclidean algorithm so if i take r power x in mod n ultimately i'll get m because you can see m can be written as m power 1 m power phi n minus y because in euler's theorem you can see that any number power to phi n is always congruence to 1 right so this will be equal to 1 actually m power phi n minus 1 is 1 so only left out m now m 1 minus phi 1 m is nothing but xc and xc is congruence to always 1 mod phi n so ultimately it will be r power x mod n right now in this system you can note that knowing e and n will not allow you to get phi n because to get phi n one needs to know p and q and to get p and q ultimately one needs to factorize this n even n is known but already rs exam works on the assumption that a large prime number is not possible to factorize computationally so therefore even though n is known p and q are not known right so if p and q are not known ultimately phi n will be not known so therefore one will not able to get this x so once one will not get to get this x ultimately will not able to get the original message which is sent that by the sender or the customer right so i'll just give an example here now before that how we basically the standard information how we send letters to numbers for a text with k letters we generally use american standard code for information exchange these are already available uh, m1 up to mk a single letter m and n is 26 that means there are 26 letters 26 numbers given by different aic values then the message will be written as an expansion in the base 256 it is a base right so it is a k digit number in the base 256 if i write 10 in place of 10 it will be a km digit number with k base 10 base it is 256 base that's why because here i have 20 256 values available in ASCII system so when decoding again we'll break we'll receive m and again expand it uh, like this to get this m not m1 f to m mk and once I get M1, M2, these will represent some letters using this S, C, I, C, I, I, and then we'll get the original message as well. So I'll do an example. In this example, I just choose P to be 23. Obviously, P and Q are I'm taking smaller numbers, right? Otherwise, it is quite difficult to do the computation. But for computer use, generally a larger primes are used. P23, Q20 is 37, then N will be at 51, which is obviously easy to factorize. But if P and Q are larger, it will not be possible. Then phi n would be nothing but 729. Now, if one needs c, there are many values of e possible, but I'm taking a simple one. E. Then using Euclidean algorithm, I can find the inverse of 7 in 792. And I can see that 679 is the inverse of 7 in modulo 792. Okay. So that x will be used to get the original MSS. And since one does not know this. Uh, P, Q, and phi n will not able to get this x. That means one does not know the 729. So once one does not know 729, ultimately he cannot use a Euclidean algorithm to get signal some time. So in this process, suppose someone wants to send a message yes. Then by ASCII codes, y level as 89, e level as 69, and s level as 689. Then the yes message will be uh, leveled as the three digit let a three digit number in the base 256 which will be 5457241 okay so this expansion in the base 256 so since this m 5457241 is bigger than the number available n 851 is the product of the two numbers we just ex we just uh, take expansion of that number in the base 851 okay because we are working in modulo n so the numbers has to be in modulo n, uh, inside modulo n so modulo n will contain 0 up uh, 1 up to uh, 0 up to 850 the co prime numbers to 851 right those will give you 
those will have unit others will not have unit but i can take zero to up to 851 so in that system i'll get 629 844 and 7 these are smaller number than s51 actually i want some smaller number than 851 to perform modulo n operations n operations then since i considered e i take power 7 e to be 7 so i take power 7 to this number 629 845 and 7 and i get the numbers 581 788 and 626 so one the merchant will receive these numbers and then use the deciphering deciphering means they will take power 629 uh, 679 to 5818 788 and 626 to get the original message okay one can try this but i am taking another example where i can get the deciphering suppose i get the message as 686 737 84 in this process and one as well with the same system then i take the power 679 which is the inverse of 7 and i get the values 4541 451 450 405 599 and 1 okay then these numbers will be sent in the base 851 because in modulo n these were so this will be 8121 and then to recover this message that means the uh, marsan will get this message this number and he will expand in the base of the values of ascii and it will be given 77 65 uh, 85 it is 256 power 2 and this is 256 power 3 okay 72 so the numbers that i got is 77 65 85 and 72 and 77 represent m 65 m 85 t and 72 h okay and we can say that these letters actually form math okay so knowing only e will not be suffixed to get the original message one needs to get x which can be obtained only if one knows y okay so therefore the rx section in that sense uh it says that e and n are pub, uh, public keys and phi p q are private keys in the rsa crypto system okay so one day the uh, one finder algorithm to factorize the composite numbers the rsa crypto system will not work from that day okay okay so the next crypto system uh, i'll talk about is the lgml crypto system so already i told you that uh, the lgml crypto system is uh, based on the discrete log logarithm problem, which was uh, introduced by Daffy Hellman in the KX program. What is discrete logarithm problem? This is also one uh, one way function, one way function like factorization of prime numbers. So if Z is a primitive root in GP and H is any non zero element, right? So since Z is a denominator, I can take the all powers and I can keep on doing that. So I can see what are the possible numbers I can get. So obviously, at some point, I'll get h, right? So this, if z is known and x is known, it is always easy to get h in modulo p. But if somebody knows h and z, h and z, then it is not computationally easy to get x in modulo p. So this is the base of LGML crypto system. And the problem is to finding this exponent x such that z and h are known. But this x can be found if we work it with uh, real, line, real line. Because in real line, the logarithm is well known. What is x? x is log of h more, uh, base z. In real line, we already know the logarithm table, so we can find it. But in mod p or any groups, these logarithms are not so well um, uh, well defined. Right? So therefore, finding x is not so easy if, easy if p is very large. p is very large means gp. The uh, gp is very large. It will have more elements. Because taking powers of g one by one is always time consuming. And it may not be possible if p is a very large prime number to find all the prime, all the powers of z. Okay, so that's what. If one can get um, all powers of x, in a time uh, computationally, ultimately, this algorithm system will not work from that day as well. 
or even if a logarithm can be defined for a groups, finite groups, or GP will define so that the indices can indexes or exponent can be obtained, then the algebraic crypto system will not work. So therefore, the algebraic crypto system basically relies on the fact that computing power z power x mod p is always easy, but difficult to find this x knowing z and z power x mod p. Okay, that means if you know z and z power x, then x may not be computationally easy to find in modulo p if p is a large prime number. That's what the base of LGML crypto system. So what is this crypto system states here? Simple, the Martian chooses a sufficiently large prime number. This is because so that one cannot exhaustively get all the powers of z, right? Because if the large prime number, gp will contain many elements, right? So one gp contain many elements, all powers of g will have, we need to find more powers of z, which may not be computationally feasible to obtain. So therefore we take a large prime number and a primitive element z, okay? And we'll make both, uh, we'll make g to be public. We'll not make p to be public, but g to be public, okay? So z will be known to everyone. Then the merchant sues a number a, which is co-prime to p obviously, and compute the z power a. Okay, so one z power a is computed. He will make this also available to all. That means the Martian will make available p, which is a large prime number, g, which is the generator of gp, or primitive element of gp, and g power a. But knowing all this, one will not able to get a because of the discrete logarithm problem, right? So now he will tell, the Martian will tell you, because P, G, Z power A will be known to all. So he'll tell his customer, all customers, suppose to send a credit card and his credit card number, and the credit card number is M, because it is a number obviously will convert it to number by ASCII number if that is there. So then we'll ask to choose a number B, any number, there is no problem with that B, and find the power G power B and M into G power AB. How G power AB will be obtained? Because G power A is already known, and B is chosen by the customer. So obviously can Z power A whole power B can be obtained, right? So this power so less can be obtained. So G power B and M G power AB will be computed by each customer and sent to the merchant. Now the merchant will receive two things. One, G power B and M G A power B. And already with him, A is there. A is not known to anyone, but only to the merchant, right? And A also cannot be obtained from this uh, well-known things, P, Z, and Z power A because of this logarithmic problem. So then what the merchant will do to get the original message is that he will find Z power minus AB. How Z power A power minus AB can be obtained? Because since the customers send Z power B, Z power B power BP minus A minus A, he will obtain. Why P minus A minus minus A? Because I'm going to the positive integers. And one can say that g power b power p minus one is actually one, mod p. Because of the, um, uh, what I can say is um, how much last theorem, uh, little theorem, how much little theorem. So therefore, to make it positive, I'm letting p minus a minus one, p minus a. So taking from here, I can get z power minus a b, because a is known to the merchant, and b will be sent by the customer. So z power minus a b can be obtained from gp. And then to complete m, simply, I'll multiply this R, which is basically sent the encrypted message or credit card number with the Z power minus AB. Because M would be nothing but M G power minus AB, G power minus AB, which will be nothing but R into G power minus AB, right? Because R is already given by the customer to the person, and Z power minus AB is obtained by the person using the information sent by the customer and the information that is with him. Okay, so here again, Defi Elman, uh, the uh, discrete log curtain problem is the base of the LGML crypto systems. Okay, and the only thing, the larger prime number is also one of the problem then one is to check because primality is not easy to check. Larger prime number giving any number you're giving, you cannot say it is a prime number or not. So sometimes it may be, uh, we may use um, some algorithm like um, you can say, uh, the probabilistic algorithm 
to have a higher probability that a larger prime number is a prime okay then this one so for example if i give an example here p is 29 obviously small i take it for my computation z is 14 then i can take a positive integer a okay so if then uh, g power a a will be known to the merchant only so is 27 obviously so 14 power 17 is 12 right and suppose i want to send a message again yes using the algebraic crypto system using this then yes alphabet will be corresponding to 25 b and 19 okay then the person will choose as a positive integer the customer will choose a positive integer b any positive integer no is no condition on that and send us the values g power b send to the merchant actually g power b for every um, uh, number then m into m means uh, for everyone 25 into 12 power 10 5 into 20, 12 power 10 and 19 into 12 power 10 mod 29 and these values will be sent these values will be sent to the merchant 13 4 24 and 10 13 is basically z power b but b is not known to merchant as well only z power b is known so then you will compute z power b minus a because a is already known 7 so minus a means it is 21 because 29 minus 7. Sorry, I think I have missed it. It is 20 uh, or P minus 1. Sorry, P minus 1 minus A, 28 minus 7 is 21. 13 minus 21 is more 28. So now original message can be obtained by multiplying by this 20 with, with this cipher numbers. So 30, uh, 4 minus 24 into 28, 24 into 28, and 10 into 28 in modulo 29. And then we get the numbers 25, 5, and 19, which are actually original numbering of the message yes. So ultimately it will give you yes. Okay. So the whole crypto systems, if you look at, are based on some one-way functions. If these one-way functions are known, in one can construct a one-way function, trapdoor function, which are not computationally feasible to find the inverse function, like the uh, discrete log problem or the factorization of prime numbers, uh, factorization of integers then one can always construct a crypto system easily. And also there's a possibility that one day these crypto systems will not work anymore, right? Because one day someone may uh, find the algorithm where the, uh, um, what you can say is uh, the factorization is possible for a larger integer. And also the free helm, uh, the uh, discrete logarithm problem is also solvable. There are many such uh, one way uh, function like NEPSE problem, right so that is also used for some crypto systems there are many one way functions there so i'm just uh, briefing two which uses a completely number theory napsa problem use some kind of linear algebra ways as well so i'm not going into that here. so that's what so these are the two crypto system which completely based on number theory i have discussed here um, this is another problem that i have done i think the same kind of thing if i want to send a message m 20, 2132 the same process can be done actually. There is nothing different compared to the previous problem. Right? Using the alchemical the textbooks, references, if one goes wants to go through a basic course on number theory and cryptography, then they can go the elementary number theory book by Burton and Neil Cobley's book as well. It's a fundamental book these are basically. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for the very nice talk. <clears throat> uh, so we have uh, some questions from the audience uh, and I also request if there are other questions to write in the chat. Um, so the first question was, uh, it was asked uh, when you were explaining public and private uh, key crypto system and uh, could you repeat once again the difference between private and public key? So you have explained this, but if you can explain it again, somebody has out. Yeah. So in private is actually a crypto system where uh, there's only one key first of all it is only one key like if i say a, a fine cipher it is ax plus b a comma b is the key but in public key crypto system there is two kinds of key one is public key another is private key that is the first difference that one can say second difference uh, in private key crypto system the keys uh, is supposed to be known by the sender right the secret key but in public key crypto system 
uh, the uh, sender supposed to know only the public key, which is known to the all people. But the private key will be only with the recipient or the merchant who is supposed to get the message. That is the second. Third is that in public key, private key crypto system, uh, if one knows the enciphering function, that means if one knows the keys or enciphering function, automatically get the deciphering function as well. So that means he will have the complete knowledge of the system. Even though one should not get the whole information except the uh, owner of the system. But in public key crypto system, even if one knows the enciphering function or enciphering keys, will not able to get the deciphering function or deciphering key. Okay, so these three are the main uh, differences of private and public key crypto system. And in public private key systems are symmetric because deciphering function is same as deciphering function. But in public publicly, this is not quite, these are quite different. They're quite, so this is called asymmetric uh, crypto system as well. Hope um, you get the answer. Uh, then Sharmila Dayal is asking, uh, what are the methods of for generating secret key apart from using number theoretic methods or using neural networks? Uh, there are many methods uh, used to uh, find the uh, secret keys, right? Except number theory, I do not know much, if I frankly speak. Okay. Because I basically studied the number theory part and crypto that is used here, in that sense. Uh, Partho Protein Borua is asking about the security. So, uh, which type of number theory is used for uh, the security in cryptography? Uh, yeah, that's what I have uh, told already. If okay. you look at private key crypto system, uh, these are quite difficult to check the security, right? The security will on increase only if uh, different uh, function, enciphering function are used for different functions, different customers, which is actually always time changing as well as um, in terms of budget also it is uh, very difficult or uh, huge. Right? But in public key crypto system, uh, you can see that uh, this is completely based on number theory. Based on number theory is that if you look at the RSA crypto system, it completely relies on the fact that a large uh, prime number, large integer cannot be factorized. If one can factorize it, ultimately the RSA crypto system will not work. So it means the complete RSA crypto system is based on the factorization of integers, right? If he can get an algorithm, algorithm to wait, get a factorization of any integer, large integer, then the RSA system, system will not work anymore. <clears throat> but until that is done, the crypto system will not, will work. Similarly, discrete logarithm problem is also finding the power in modulo, right? And this is also in modulo, is a number theory. So in number theory, basically finding powers is not easy in higher higher prime modulo. That's why we take P is to be a large prime number. And there are always different ways to check the primality or factorization, but those are not so computationally uh, uh, exact, exact in the sense that uh, we can only say that uh, a number is prime up to some probability if it is a large prime number but not exactly we can say it is a prime number or less, right? So those are actually numerical aspect that one can, these are actually still a problem, uh, research areas where cryptography and crypto analysis people keep on doing. Um, Suros uh, Lekharu has a question. So is the crypto system which is used in uh, banking sector or telecom sector uh, are similar to each other? If the systems are not similar, then what kind of feature of crypto system makes them different from each other? Uh, which two? Uh, banking, banking sector and telecom sector. Uh, they must have used some crypto system, obviously. And obviously that would be obviously some public key. More recently, actually the, uh, 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 the, at the moment, if I say modern cryptography, elliptic cup cryptography is, is used mostly actually because it uh, is um, more uh, secure comparatively compared to rsa crypto system defi hellman crypto system all this crypto system 
So I don't know what is the crypto system they use, but they must have used some crypto system. Uh, but I can say that the elliptic crypto system is the most secure crypto system at the moment that uh, people use. Bishal Patwari is asking, uh, is the barcode written behind books or any product based on number theory? Is there any security based uh, system for these barcodes? Obviously, those are security for reasons only. You can check in uh, like, uh, there is always a, uh, if you go to a shopping mall, then uh, they scan the barcode, right? So scanning the barcode, they automatically get the uh, price of that uh, item. So there is always a crypto system used between, or a crypto system used between this barcode and the description of these items. There is always, that is there always. Dhiraj Singh is asking uh, how to get an idea to define a new public key crypto system using some known fact of algebra. Uh, if I know that ultimately I can uh, construct a new crypto system. So it is basically you need to study that uh, one needs to computationally verify that uh, if you give a one-way function and that means one way of uh, computing, it is not feasible to find the inverse of that in some way. Uh, Mohammed uh, Sadukar Rahman is asking, is there any mathematical logic behind the 12 digit Adhar number? Uh, well, is it, uh, what is that? What is the Adhar question? Number. So is there any mathematical logic behind the Adhar number, Adhar card number? I guess there is because um, um, they must have used it because um, uh, the Adhar number is, cannot be uh, if you have other number, others cannot use the other number, right? And there is always a security uh, attached to it. And the security must be, and I think uh, some years back, I uh, we, we had the news that the other uh, information has been leaked. So those uh, are always some security issues are there basically, but these are always some crypto system used to make the other numbers because the other number contain all details of a person, like uh, fingerprint, yeah, our uh, eye scan. So there is always a question to save the, all those data. So there is a question, but I don't know if it means something. Uh, so it's uh, Ajay Gupta is asking, uh, can you please explain the uh, concept behind math, M-A-T-H in capital math number? So I think it was one of the examples that you gave. Yeah, I have done an example just to explain the yeah. process. Okay. So uh, there is one more question now. Um, it's a general question. So how can a mathematics student get uh, this knowledge about crypto system as this topic is not in the MSc course or is there any book or course that? Uh, obviously there are many mathematics if one, uh, obviously already at the introduction BK Sanmasar has told that mathematics is nothing but interest. If you have interest in something, Ultimately, uh, the course curriculum will not uh, barrier to it. Whether a topic is in the course uh, curriculum or not, it should not bother you. So if, if you are interested, if you have the basic knowledge of number theory, ultimately one always can go to the cryptographic or crypto analysis. There is always a possibility. But uh, in certain cases, like there are certain areas of number theory, those actually use the permutation polynomials where the people uh, study using number theoretical aspects. But obviously, these are not in the curriculum. But one can study themselves to, if one is interested. Uh, Subrat uh, Parida is asking: Can we predict the future of prime numbers, uh, such as any formula, uh, by which we can predict it in higher digits through crypto system? So, question is not so clear. But I think he is asking if you can predict uh, prime numbers using crypto systems. Mm, till now it is not there. The, actually prime numbers are quite fascinating. Uh, there are many open problems related to prime numbers as well, in numberical way. And these are not completely well understood yet. And so it's quite difficult uh, to get knowledge about the prime numbers. Right? Even though there are many uh, properties are known, but still, even though the prime numbers looks quite simple, but these are quite um, like mysterious thing in number theory aspect. 
So I don't know whether there is any generating function for a prime number. I don't think there is. So there is a question from Arvind Pandey, which is just what is fundamental number, if it means anything to you. Fundamental number. Yeah. So he asked this twice, but I don't know. I mean, Arvind, I, if you can just explain a bit more what you want to ask. I don't know what his fundamental number is. Uh, so Nomi Begum is asking uh, if you can say a little bit more about uh, probability algorithms in crypto system. Uh, probability algorithm. Uh, okay, so um, there are actually some definite ways. Definite ways in the sense that uh, we'll show theorem. Most of you know, I guess. If p is a prime, if pi p is prime, if and only p minus one factorial is congruent to minus one mod p. So this will definitely answer about the prime numbers. But if you look at um, the Euler, uh, the uh, Fermat's last little theorem, it says that a power uh, p minus one is congruent to one mod p. If p is a prime and p does not divide a, correct? So <clears throat> there are some uh, composite numbers also which satisfy the same property. Right. If p is a prime, a power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. But there are certain composite numbers which also satisfy the same property. Suppose n is a composite number, a power p, n minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod n for some prime composite numbers. So that means this is not a characterization of the prime numbers. Right? But And these composite numbers are called pseudo primes. These are not prime, but satisfy certain properties similar to the prime numbers. These are called pseudo primes. So the pseudo primes are actually used to check the primality, whether a number is prime to some order or some uh, probability or not. So what is done actually, like uh, suppose I want to check a number is a prime or not. I find that you, I try to check the Euler's theorem, uh, sorry, uh, Fermat's last theorem, uh, Fermat's little theorem. I try to check it. If it is satisfied, there are two things. It can be prime, it may not be prime. Right? Either, either it is a prime or pseudo prime. So there's a probability, half probability. Correct? For AA. Suppose now I sense this A for a different number, B1. So again, I check for the B1. Suppose for B1 also, it satisfies the same. So that means the probability is again half. So half into half, it becomes one by four. So that's how the probability that it is not uh, composite becomes smaller. So if you keep on doing the same process n times, the probability that it is not a composite number becomes one by two power n. But at some point, if it does not satisfy the Fermat's little theorem, a power n minus one is congruent to one mod n, so ultimately you can directly say that it is not a prime number, it has to be a composite number, if it does not satisfy. But if it satisfy, there are half half probability. So that is one of the probabilities ways. There are many uh, probability aspect to use uh, is used to find um, the, the in primality testing actually. So this is a question I think we have already addressed this in the talk, but I'll still uh, say it. So if a sender sends an encrypted message to a receiver and if a third party has knowledge about encryption, in uh, so is it possible that the third party can decode it? In public uh, private key crypto system, it's always possible. But in public key system, it is not always possible. He needs to have some other information, secret information. One supposed to know some secret information to get the original message. Uh, so this is a, uh, one more general question. Uh, somebody is asking that uh, uh, she wants to do research in cryptography. So if you can suggest some books which could uh, get her started. There are many standard books on cryptography actually. The basic, uh, if you want to start with, to have an idea what the crypto systems and number theory are related, you can start with the Kabli's book that is given in the reference. Or there is uh, there are many books like uh, you can say Rosen. I've used uh, K uh, Rosen R Rosen. Sorry, uh, some Rosen. I forgot the name. There is a Rosen's book, uh, Washington's books. There are many books on cryptography. Um, so. Aditya is asking, uh, can cryptography be integrated with uh, something like game theory to build a big data security model? Um, I guess uh, there can be, but I, I don't have knowledge about that. Uh, Anubrata is asking if, suppose we know a formula for prime numbers in some form, then uh, what is its impact on cryptography? 
uh, it will have big impact actually. One thing, uh, if you have a formula for the prime numbers, ultimately you can tell all the prime numbers, right? So that means one way defining large prime numbers becomes easier. That is the first thing. And second thing, when you know all the prime numbers, so this refactorization will also be easier to do because one only needs to check the composite or the factorization with the help of those prime numbers only. It becomes easier, the factorization. So once the factorization is easier, ultimately RSA crypto system will not work at all. So there are always impact on the prime, prime numbers on certain crypto systems. So at this moment, we don't have any more questions. Um, so I, I now want to ask if uh, Dr. Mohanto wants to say something, otherwise we can close the session. I can stop sharing okay. the screen, right? No? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Gautamda, for a very beautiful topic with us. Uh, uh, this is a very important topic in this particular and uh, yeah, some uh, participant has already seen the syllabus also. Uh, when this kind of thing should be included, uh, and uh, I think uh, to you for a uh, energetic and topic. So uh, his network seems to be a bit of a problem, but I, I guess uh, he's trying to thank you. So th thank you from my side as well for the very nice talk and also for giving us your valuable time. Uh, not only with the, talk, the opportunity, answering all the questions and also apologies that you had to do this again today because of the problem. Not so an thank issue. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. So I can leave, right? Yes. Yes.